I want you to find the book of Leviticus chapter 19 and also while you're doing that, find Acts chapter 16. Now I have here a Bible, that's a book, and I can actually have markers in each page. I don't know how on earth you do that on your device, but um, uh, we're going to go to Leviticus 19 and then also Acts 16. I want to use both passages uh, this evening. I'll give you a moment uh, to find that. One of the things that I've considered over the many years of ministry in working with people and just kind of paying attention are people who wrestle with what I would call lifelong issues or cycles of destruction. I think of a preacher that I'm familiar with who uh, had a very powerful, very powerful uh, ministry, was uh, well known around the world and uh, was caught in a moral a failure. And uh, as he began to process that, he made a statement and he said that he had, as a child, had gotten, had become a Christian, had given himself to the work of God and was actually used very powerfully, but said that he had a lifelong issue with this particular area of his life. Powerful ministry, well known, and yet from time to time, this would visit him. What astounded me is after this very public uh, failure, it continued to recur. Again, even after the failure and all the repercussions. And I just began to ponder that. You know, back in the 1800s, there was what is known as Victorian England. This is because Queen Victoria reigned for a, a pretty much the entire century. And uh, England was at its apex. It was called, uh, it was said that the sun never set on the British Empire and it had reached it, the heights of its influence in the world under Queen Victoria or the Victorian era. If you know anything about that period of time, you know that uh, it was a time uh, because of Queen Victoria where there was a, an extreme emphasis on outward purity. Churches grew, some of those well-known preachers preached in that era. And even they say you could look at uh, interior design and even furniture legs were covered. And uh, this, uh, and so you had this, but at the same time, where there was such an emphasis on the external, at the same time, it did not mitigate crime or evil. And that became an interesting thing. They thought if society could control human behavior on the outside, how come it doesn't solve the problem on the inside. And so this fed into a whole line of thought that has become common vernacular in our world today. And that is the duality of man. In other words, that man has a good side, but he also has a dark side. The term began to be moved around that time called the alter ego. Uh, Sigmund Freud made his uh, name on this idea of the male or of the ego and something you have the person you are on the outside but it can be an entirely different person on the inside and then robert louis stevenson wrote a book back in the 1880s most of you have heard of called the strange case of dr jekyll and mr hyde and that book became famous and today is still referenced because he managed to capture the idea of a man dr jekyll that was respected and admired but there was something else going on on the inside of this man. He thought he could control it, but in the end, it ended up taking control of him. I say that, beloved, because one of the things that I've observed over my many years of being a pastor now are seeing patterns of where people fall into what I call cycles of destruction. They do very well. They're, they have qualities, they have an understanding of God, they, but, but then uh, they tend to, uh, from time to time, fall into a cycle of destruction, whether that's sin or depression. They go back to drugs or alcohol. They start cutting themselves again. And they begin to go right back into areas of life uh, they where they would be the first to testify of their victory, and indeed there has been victory. But it seems that as if there's something else that's working there. And I want to address that. I was in prayer meeting a while back, several months ago, praying for people. 
And as I began to pray, I felt God began to just speak to me about this passage of scripture. And so I, this is for, to help you tonight. There are people here you're really going to identify with. Others of you know somebody that will uh, uh, identify with this. I want to preach a sermon called The Demonic Whisper tonight. And we're going to look at two verses of scripture. In Leviticus 19, verse 31, just one verse of scripture. It says, give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord, your God. And now we move over to Acts chapter 16 and verse 16, where the scripture says these words. Now it happened as we went to prayer. This is Luke, remember? Acts is a personal story of Luke and his ministry with Paul. As it happened, as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, and who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did this for many days, but Paul greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Father, open our hearts tonight. God, by revelation, set men and women free. Jesus Christ went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Open the prison doors tonight. Cause men and women that even now are listening to a demonic whisper to recognize it for what it is. And let them be delivered in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now let's begin and talk about familiar spirits this evening. So uh, we know that Leviticus and Deuteronomy were instructions to the priests and to the nation. And how they were ought to keep themselves from the pagan world that they were about to become exposed to. They were going to go into the promised land. That land was inhabited by uh, uh, people and nations that were given completely over to sin uh, and wickedness. And so much is said in those two uh, books about uh, the difference between uh, God and his word and the world they were going to be exposed to. And so when you read these books, uh, you find over and over again clear warnings concerning idolatry, concerning sexual immorality, uh, and our subject tonight, uh, witchcraft. And our scripture says in verse 31, give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And so it's clear that God is saying, when you get there, you have to understand the threat of witchcraft. You have to recognize that it is evil. So let me make a couple of statements before I go on tonight. If you want to learn about the occult or witchcraft, learn about it from the Bible. You don't have to go down the flip side. I don't even know if flip side is still around. It's not there anymore. It's there. You got to be kidding me. And uh, uh, you know that this idea that if you want to learn about the occult, you got to go to a, uh, you know, some medium. You got to go out to St. Mary's somewhere and find some witch. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, let me help you right now. If you want to learn about Satan, don't read the satanic Bible. Read the Holy Bible. That is not how you're not going to learn from Netflix about uh, God or the devil. Witchcraft is simply the pursuit of spiritual power outside of God's revelation and his word. That's it. You want power, you want spiritual revelation. It's all right here for you, man. But if you don't want it from here, you want it from somewhere else. You are getting involved in witchcraft. We could talk about astrology tonight or sorcery, which means weed. Or you could talk about Ouija boards or curanderas, uh, witch doctors, whatever. You like. But beloved, it, it doesn't matter. It covers everything outside of what this book says this evening. But I want you to consider tonight one particular expression of witchcraft, which is a familiar spirit. What is a familiar spirit? This term is found, actually it's pretty rare, in the Bible. Three times in the book of Leviticus, in chapter 19 and then in chapter 20, they are warned very clearly 
about familiar spirits. They're going to be coming into a place and along the way, they are going to encounter familiar spirits. In our verse, it says, give no regard to them. If you move over to chapter 20, it says, do not prostitute yourself to them or surrender to them. And it's talking about entering into a relationship with one. And then later on in chapter 20, it speaks about those who have a familiar spirit should be put to death. That's pretty strong language. Don't regard them. Be careful because you may want to lie down with them. And if you get, if you find someone who has one, put them to death. Pretty heavy stuff. And so what is the Bible talking about? It's talking about, it's not talking about the astrologist or the people who just simply, you know, want to dabble in witchcraft, but it's describing something that I want you to see tonight from the word of God. It's talking about people who enter into a relationship with the spirit. I want you to think with me tonight about that. Very interesting when you begin to do a little bit of research on familiar spirits. Let me give you one definition right here. The Hebrew word for familiar spirit is orb, which actually translates a leathern bottle. To the ears of the ancient Hebrews, the hollow sound of familiar spirit speaking through a medium sounded though as it were coming out of a skin of a bottle. So out of a skin bottle. Now, what it's saying there, and so is, and in fact, in Strong's, it actually says, there's Strong's concordance, that one translation is a ventriloquist. And so you begin to get a picture here, and that picture was somebody who had a spirit, a familiar spirit was somebody who could speak, or a spirit would take control of them and would speak. And when people listened to them, it wasn't coming from their vocal cords or mouth, it was coming out of them as a, 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 a uh, this idea, one definition, and that's why I chose this title, a, let's put that up, a whisper to feel safe or a refuge. And the idea with there was that this person has engaged in a spirit and this spirit will speak to them. And they said that it sounded like a whisper. And what happens is we're talking about somebody who develops a relationship or sees this or views this as a source of help and it is used and it works through them. Let me give you a couple of definitions. Many of you probably go to Wikipedia when you want to find something. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, the uh, Wikipedia, put that up. Wikipedia definition says an alter ego, a personal demon or a spirit companion. Wikipedia, that's not, uh, you know, last time I checked, not a Pentecostal dictionary. But you think about it because this idea that this person has something working in them. People sometimes refer to the personal demon. A lot of New Agers will call it a spirit companion. But I have something. and This something helps me. This something gives me a refuge. This speaks to me, it whispers to me, and it helps me to get along. Merriam-Webster's dictionary puts it this way. A spirit or demon that serves or prompts an individual. This is Webster's dictionary. Okay, I'm not reaching for this sermon tonight. We're talking about something that has been a part of the human condition for a long, long time. Where people have this experience or this relationship with them. And it serves them and it influences them. Another uh, commentator made this statement. The word familiar is from the Latin familiarius, meaning a household servant. And it again, lends the idea that I have this power. I have this presence, I have this asset, and it helps me. It serves me. It gives me an advantage. And, and with that, I'm able to do things. Now think with me tonight about our text in Acts 16, because in Acts 16, we're talking about a girl that has a familiar spirit. I preached on that uh, young girl before. May I say tonight that young girls can have this? And the Bible says that she had the spirit of pythos or python. 
And it goes back to serpent power, which goes back to Pharaoh and the power of Pharaoh's throne was a python. It was the power of the serpent. And uh, they, again, the ancients have this. And so here was this girl when she had this gift. In fact, the scripture says in verse 16, it brought her masters much profit. So we're talking about a girl that has a relationship with the spirit, but this is profitable. This is not something that holds her back. In our mind, we tend to think of people that are, are affected by a demon spirit as being oppressed and impoverished and all these horrible. No, no, the Bible says it brought much profit. That this was actually an asset. This is something that she would look toward to and look to and rely on. And, and that this helped her. It separated her. It made her unique. It made her of value. I want to tell you, church, this is more common than we realize if we think about it. Some of you that are older might be familiar with the 27 Club. The 27 Club is a term that is given to the, uh, back in, I think, imagine the 70s or so, but it's probably still true today. And that is, it is referring to people that made it in the entertainment industry who killed themselves at age 27. If you're an older person, then you would know Jim Morrison or Jimi Hendrix or Janis Joplin, all who died in a matter of months. These were some of the most well-known, most popular rock and roll artists of that generation. And at the age of 27, they all overdosed and died. Back then, there was a, a, a common knowledge, even when I was a long-haired doper, about uh, how people will make a deal with the devil to succeed. That they will, they will, they have this outstanding about talent and ability. Some have called it a demonic anointing. All because they have this friend who helps them succeed. Many of you are familiar with the musical Phantom of the Opera, which again is the same idea that has circulated for many, many, many years. That people get a friend who helps them. That is a demon a whisperer who sets them apart and this is a relationship. Let me put up this quote. This was interesting that I just came across. It says several famous musicians have adopted alter egos over the years, usually to indicate a new creative direction or deep dive into their personal emotions. Removed from their popular stage persona, notable examples being David Bowie and Prince, Janet Jackson, Mariah Carey, Beyonce, Eminem, Nicki Minaj, among others. I don't even know some of those people. But the idea here is that these people have gone on record to say that when I perform, I have an alter ego. Somebody's helping me. So next time you buy one of their uh, music or download, you might want to stop and ask us, do I really want their helper in my mind? So what we're talking about is something very, very, very interesting. But as I'm here, as I, last time I checked, I'm not preaching to a bunch of recording stars here. Because it's not just in the entertainment industry. Years ago, we had a very interesting thing happen here. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I was in the Philippine Islands uh, enjoying lumpias. But uh, while I was there, Middle of a, of a day, I'm not sure, I think it was a Friday, they were cleaning the building, the ladies were cleaning a building, and somebody pulled up in a van and literally carried a girl into our building who was in full-on demonic manifestation. They, uh, the poor cleaning ladies, they, they were here to clean the church, now they got to clean something else, and uh, they gathered around uh, uh, other workers that were here, and they prayed for this girl, and... Uh, Eventually, we're able to kind of get a handle on her. The men who brought her, the brother of the girl that is the one who brought her, they actually began to come to church for a while. I got to know them, and they told me this story. Listen to me. They said that what happened, where this all came from, is that in their family, when they were very young, their mother had died. And so they came from a culture that believed in the principle of the whisperer or the demonic whisperer or the medium or the familiar spirit. And so they believed that one of the children would have a gift and that gift would be the ability to communicate with the dead mother. 
And it was this girl who was now uh, either a late teenager in her 20s who was chosen as the one with the gift. And so when she was little, the family would gather around and this little girl would go into a trance and they could dance and then the mother would speak to them through this little girl. It was a gift. It was viewed as a gift. It was not viewed as something wicked or evil. In fact, it distinguished her. She found power in that. And she became that medium. In our scripture, it describes this girl. They would go on an outreach and this girl would all of a sudden begin to manifest and begin to speak out. These are the prophets of the Most High God who show unto us the way of salvation. That was not her and Paul knew it wasn't her. It was something in her that began to speak out. And the Bible, or and the, the, and so this brother or this man told me that this girl would do this and she had that gift. But by the time she came around, she was completely tormented. You know, in boot camp for a number of years, the issue of cutting was a big deal. Many of these girls would begin to admit that Christian girls and when you begin to ask why, they, they couldn't necessarily articulate, but there was something about it that brought relief from anxiety. It was a whisper, something that said, come in this direction and you'll find strength. And you'll find the ability to manage your situation. People turn to drugs for that reason. People turn to pornography for that reason. They, all of a sudden, there's that voice that says, come this way. And in this, you're going to regain some sense of power, control in your life. And here, God is warning them. He's saying, listen, not every spirit shows up with a pointed hat and a broom, with fangs and a tail. Sometimes they come with a nice whisper and says, come on. And find relief. I want to talk to you then about friend or foe this evening. Cicero, going back a couple of thousand years, referred to the alter ego as a trusted friend. This is a human condition. This is something that you and I need to consider. Because the truth is, is you can develop a friendship with the spirit. You can develop a relationship was a spirit. When we think that this will give us an advantage or provide for us relief. The uh, uh, popular uh, psychology of the Victorian era was that uh, there was such repressed desires that it pushed immoral behavior into the subconscious. Or it's kind of like on the outside, you know, you have to play ball, you have to comply. But all this junk that's inside me is being pushed into this uh, subconscious uh, and this alter ego is taking and, and eventually it's going to blow up and manifest. And terrible, terrible behavior. All in the context that it is your friend. How many remember the story of the Garden of Eden? The story of the Garden of Eden is the serpent befriending Eve. This is not the serpent who announces evil intentions and Eve, I want to destroy you and I want, I, I'm going to ruin you and I'm going to bring a curse upon you. No, no, no. He showed up as a friend. He showed up of saying, I have your best interest at heart. Listen to me and be, and when I tell you, you're going, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to have understanding. And the entire scenario is in the context of, of somebody who is listening to an evil voice. Who's listening to a demonic whisper and comes to believe this is the thing to do. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen. Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. But I think we all know that this is not beyond the devil's playbook this evening. To come as a friend and to convince you that in your moment of, of, of difficulty, your stress, come on. 
I'll help you. Psalms 41 verse 9, I think is very interesting because this is the fourth time the word familiar is mentioned. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, wait my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. So here's David and he is referring in context to Ahithophel, who was his closest friend. Ahithophel was his intimate. And yet we all know that when David's son Absalom rose in rebellion, that it was Ahithophel who used his as association with power, with his prestige and his reputation to turn on David and to allow that rebellion to succeed at least temporarily. But here's David, he has this friend. If you were to read the whole Psalm, Ahithophel has been undermining him for a long time, but David didn't know it. It was a familiar friend. This was somebody that David leaned on, that David trusted him. And he has no idea that this familiar friend is actually eroding his dominion, undermining him, taking their intimate words and spreading them and twisting and all that he would do. Uh, but David didn't know this was my familiar friend. It's possible tonight to be somehow convinced this is good for me. This is helping me. People who are under pressure, who retreat into destructive patterns. When they're under pressure, when things aren't going right, instead of going towards Jesus, towards the will of God, it, it, what, well, you know what, and they yield to depression. They give in, they surrender to it. They, and somehow say, you know what? I am going to be better off if I just indulge this. And they just run with it. And if you talk to someone who battles it, they'll tell you there is that uh, fork in the road when they know, you know what? Am I going to go down this road again or am I going to do things? If, there I go. And actually find a relief in rage. Why do people lose their temper, blow their body, a profanity, you know, and, and, and say horrible words to the people that they, they love, their own family. And you ask, why do you, well, I'll tell you, you know why they do it? Because it feels good for that moment. Suicidal thoughts. And just say, I'm just going to go down this road. And they do not understand that there is a demonic whisper that's saying, come on. Years ago, I, I remember reading this illustration. I, I don't know if I've ever used it. And uh, it, uh, is a, it was a song. And the song is called Angel. And uh, the, the, what, what was interesting is that the song was written by somebody who had been reading Rolling Stone magazine and they were doing an article on all these popular entertainers who overdose on drugs. And uh, why is that? Why, is there, why, why do these people kill themselves? You're at the top of the world, they have all the money, they have fame, they have fortune, and yet you're in, in early in life and they do this and you all know there are, there are many, many, many of them but what was interesting is they sought to articulate what must go on in the mind of somebody who with everything that they have will overdose on drugs. And, they, and so I just want to give you a clip of some of the words. In the arms of an angel fly away from here, from this dark cold hotel room and the endlessness that you fear. You are pulled from the wreckage of your silent reverie. You're in the arms of the angel. May you find some comfort here. You know, the individual who wrote this song probably thought they were just being cool. It was an angel. It was a demonic angel. Somehow people in that place, the truth is they have had a friend with them for a long time. And that friend is, in their mind has helped them but it's not helping them anymore. Their abilities, 
And in their mind, this relationship that probably started a long, long time before they were ever famous. And there was an angel there. A familiar friend. A familiar spirit. And then we have Luke eleven twenty four. 24. The Lord Jesus says it this way. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man... He goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. Leave that up there for a moment. A spirit says, my house. We're talking about a relationship that people develop with a spirit. They don't see it that way. They call it a hobby. It was very interesting as I was reading this. I, one of the things that I came across was uh, what is called anime, which is Japanese cartoons. And the influence that it has, profound influence on. And you think, well, you know, what would be the attraction? And they, and they say, somehow they, people, something gets a hold of them. I would say to every parent here, when you're raising your children, you need to pay attention to the, their amusements. You need to pay attention to what's going on here. Because they begin, people begin to develop at an early age a relationship with something. And the Bible says, and the Lord Jesus says, the Lord Jesus, if anybody understands these dynamics, it's the Lord Jesus. And he says, unclean spirits go out of people, thank God. But I want to tell you, unclean spirits say, that's my house. I lived there. I've lived there for a long, long time. And people have found some refuge, in some place and some whisper that they've gone to and gone to and gone to. And now they come to a point, I want to end this relationship. And the spirit says, that's my house. I want to close then and talk about freedom from a familiar spirit and we'll, we'll uh, uh, pray. Here we have is a damsel tonight. Here is a young woman. Paul arrives in Philippi and as he begins to minister, he has collected a very small group of people. There's a woman named Lydia, her family. And, uh, and uh, the Bible says that this young woman begins to go to church. May I say tonight, people who go to church can have a familiar spirit. And so this young woman has gone to church. She's associating with the right people, but there's this unclean spirit that is operating inside of her. The apostle Paul, you know, it's very interesting. You know, we, we think, you know, that Paul, the very first time he saw her would have cast it out. But the reality of working with people is you can't do that, nor should you do that. He's working with this girl. In fact, the Bible says many days went by. So this was, uh, she was there, she had these issues, she's with the apostle, with the Christians there, she's gathering, but there's something not right in this girl. And the Bible says that it grieved Paul. He knew, said, there's something not right with this girl. And the Bible says that one day he became inspired and said, you know what, what's happening to her? She's not just weird, she has a strange personality, there's a spirit. Verse 18 and 19, the Bible says, she did this for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. And here the apostle Paul realized, you know, no, this isn't God's will. And this relationship that this young girl had with this spirit, she doesn't have to be this way anymore. Many days, greatly annoyed. In other words, there, there's something wrong here. There's something happening here. And at some point, Paul said, no more. I want to say to you this evening, at some point, you have to say no more. You have to say, you know what? No, no, I'm not going to do it because this is the cycle. This is the pattern. 
This is what happens. And here I go. And next thing you know, and if I bother to, to take a look back and I, I can see the, the, the rhythms uh, of my life. And there I go again. I, and, I, and why? Because something saying, come on. Come on. You can be free tonight. One of the things that I learned when I minister to people in deliverance is I have to help them understand that some of the things you feel, some of your thoughts are not you. They're an unclean spirit. I say to people that have been molested, that when they've been molested, whoever did that to you was driven by an unclean spirit. The physical damage that may have been done has long healed, but the emotional and spiritual scars exist. And if they're not careful, they impart a spirit. And what ends up happening is that person gets older and they begin to come to grips with the violation. If they do not process it, uh, it causes there to be a kink and a twist, particularly in, 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 with regard to sex. Some will become totally closed. Others will be driven by a spirit of promiscuity and lust. The spirit has attached itself to them. They develop that relationship. And they do not understand what's happened here. Rage and anger. Suicidal thoughts, homicidal thoughts. Doors have opened. And very often when you begin to deal with people, they realize that this is not just a one thing. This is a, a, a friend. It's an outlet. A number of years ago in our... Uh, 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 teen rally, I preached a sermon on rage because of the school shootings. And as I began to minister about boys, that the secret sin of young men, most of it, people think about sex, it's, it's anger and rage. And young men that have, they, they fantasize about killing. And I told them, it's not you. It's a spirit. A whisper that says, come on, just, just go with me in your mind for a little while. God said, listen, familiar spirits, don't let them defile you. Don't lie down with them. And when you find them, judge them. This is not your friend. Put up that article, Will. It says a snake owner was killed by an eight foot pet python he called his baby. An inquest has heard Daniel Brandon, 31, died from asphyxiation at his home near ba Basingstoke, Hampshire. On August 25, one of the pets, a female African rock python named Tiny, was found near his body out of its pen. Coroner Andrew Bradley said there was no doubt Mr. Brandon died as a result of contact with Tiny. And he recorded the, vic uh, uh, he recorded the, uh, the verdict of misadventure. Mr. Brandon had kept snakes for 16 years and Tiny was one of 10 snakes and 12 tarantulas. He kept in his room at his family home north of Hampshire, coroner courts heard. Judge the, the friendship tonight. This is not your friend. This is not your pet. Let's bow our heads. Our heads are bowed and we're before God tonight. And we're looking at God's word this evening. Lots of literature on what I'm speaking about tonight. Men have looked at this and considered this condition of humanity trying to understand. Here the Bible tells us what it is. It's a building of relationship with a spirit. And calling on those resources, time of pressure, time of stress. They tell us, you know, that particularly people that grow up in very, very violent, very dysfunctional homes, a lot of times their emotional outlet is fantasy. And they begin to form very strong relationships and, fueled by emotion that began to manifest and dominate and control, define them. I'm here to tell you tonight that Jesus Christ can set you free. 
An unclean spirit can go out of a man. The Bible says that he came to open prison doors, to liberate those who are bound. Satan's not your friend tonight, Eve. He's not looking out for your best interests. Tonight, God wants to work a miracle in your life. He wants to help you. The blood of Jesus Christ has power to cleanse us from sin. It has power to set us free from habits and addictions and bondages. You say, well, Pastor Ruby, I've heard that over and over again. Yet here I am. I'm here to tell you tonight, he can set you free. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from every sin. And it doesn't matter who you are and it does not matter what you've done. You can be forgiven tonight. And before I do anything else, you're in this building and you're not right with God. You need forgiveness desperately tonight. You need cleansing and freedom. Tonight, Jesus Christ wants to help you. He wants to save you. And you know where he meets us? He meets us at the foot of the cross. He meets us at the point where we are willing to admit we're sinners. And we recognize that he is a savior. If we don't think we need saving, then he can never be our savior. But when you come to him wholeheartedly and say, oh, God, be merciful to me. Jesus Christ can cleanse you and change you. Before I do anything else, maybe you're here and say, Pastor, I'm not right with God. I need forgiveness. I need Jesus Christ to set me free. And I want to pray tonight. I'm prepared to come to Christ just as I am. I'm going to come. But I want Jesus to become the Lord of my life. If that's you, I want you to raise up your hand. Put it up high where I can see it. And by holding your hand up, you're saying, I need prayer. I'm not right with God. I need Jesus Christ coming into my life. Lift up your hand. I'm going to hold this just for a minute tonight. You're here this evening and the Spirit of God is dealing with you. God is moving on you. It's like your heart is pounding right now because the Spirit of God is saying, you know where you're at. Come on now, get it right. Lift up your hand. Lift it up. Or you're backslidden. You walked with God, but you are backslidden in this place. God's dealing with you. Lift up your hand. Before I move on to other things, Pray for me. I'm not right with God. I need forgiveness. I need Jesus. I want to repent tonight. Maybe you're watching online and you're saying, I need Jesus tonight. I need God to help me. Lift up your hand just online. God sees that hand and say, I want to get my heart right. I know there are people that are watching online. They're, you know, you're in a public place. Sometimes people get all prideful and afraid to be embarrassed, but you're all alone right where you are and you, you're crying out. Say, this is my life. This is, you've just described what I've gone through. Tonight, reach out to Christ. Lift your hand. I want to get my heart right. If you're watching online, I want you to pray with me. Oh, Lord Jesus, set me free. I'm a sinner. Cleanse me. I'm sorry for my sin. I want to be set free tonight from every torment, every bondage. I believe you died for me and you rose from the dead. Tonight, I trust you entirely with my life. Become my Lord and Savior. Amen. You prayed that. Reach out to us in that contact information. We want to help you. While our heads are bowed, I want to speak to Christians here, those that are listening online. You know, this evening in a little bit, we'll pray a prayer together. But there are people here that you realize, you know what? I, I, I look at my life and I realize that I let a voice whisper to me and it always tends to take me to the same place the same behavior becomes a torment it's an alluring voice it's a seductive voice it's a voice that shrouds itself in concern and nobody understands you and people don't appreciate you and often plays the soft notes of self-pity and tells you to go back to an old friend Tonight, God wants to help us. He wants to bring freedom and deliverance this evening. Amen. And before we pray a prayer together, I'm going to ask you to stand. Everybody in this building, just stand with me, please. Let's all stand in this place. Altars are a good thing tonight. Altars are a place where we can come and say, God, in my, I'm going to take responsibility for my part. I repent of this. I've allowed this. I have developed this relationship. I've realized that there's something in me that isn't right. That causes me to keep going back. And tonight, God, I want to be free. And 
I'm going to get my heart right with God. I'm going to, uh, we're going to sing and worship God. I'm going to open these altars tonight. I invite you to find, come down, find a place to pray, and remain at the altar. Don't return back to your seat. Let's sing. We're going to worship God. These altars are open. I want to invite you to come down and find a place to pray. Maybe you're watching online. Find a place to pray and talk to God. I'm not sharing religious information with you tonight. I'm not just uh, sharing a few interesting thoughts. God really does want to help some people and set them free. We're going to sing and worship God tonight. Father in heaven, we worship you tonight. We plead the blood. Oh, Carino, Robo, Bobo, Seremanda, Riquedemando, Robo, say. Oh, Cariba, Barama, Seremandico. I want you to bow your heads with me tonight. There are people here that this is a, a battle, this is an issue that uh, you, you realize, you know what, this is where I'm at this evening and I have to recognize the familiar spirit for what it is he is not your friend he is not your pet he does not make you better he does not give you an advantage he doesn't help you deal with things you take authority well, I'm a child of God Jesus said I give you the keys to the kingdom I give them to you this is not something that we go and beg God to do for us. He says he already died on the cross and purchased our deliverance. 
It's you and I taking those keys and employing them. I'm a child of God. I no longer have to walk in the torment, in the pool of these spirits. I am free. And I'm going to appropriate God's promise in my life. Let me say it again. It is not you. It's not just you and your thoughts. There's something far, far more sinister at work here. God wants to help us. I want you to pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I claim my deliverance. Open the prison doors that have held me bound. In Jesus' name, I judge the familiar spirit. I judge the lies. I judge the witchcraft and the luring of my life back into bondage and addiction, sin, and shame. I am set free by the blood of Jesus. I am delivered. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Uh, and I judge this evil spirit and I command it to leave me and never to return. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, I plead the blood right now. God, I take authority over every foul, tormenting spirit. I take dominion over uncleanness. I take dominion over witchcraft. I take dominion over rage and hatred. God, I judge right now, Father, uh, spirits of suicide, homicide. Uh, Father, I pray, God, set men and women free. God, let the blood of Jesus purge consciences from dead works. Uh, God, bring freedom and dominion and faith and enlargement. Uh, God, we lift our eyes and we behold you who are good and faithful. Uh, Let's give God praise together right now. God, we thank you. You don't have to escape in fantasy tonight. You have the word of God. You and I have prayer. We have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We do not have to give our minds and go in that direction. And I want to tell you tonight. Some of you are going to go home and your old familiar friends are going to want to come and say, hey, knock on the door and say, can I come in? You have to say, this is no longer your house. I'm a child of God. I walk in freedom. I walk in victory. The tragedy of Luke 11 is that the mountain's house was empty. You and I tonight, we have another resident. In fact, somebody said, when the unclean spirit knocks on the door, let Jesus answer the door for you. Make up your mind, I'm going to walk in victory. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads. We're going to let you go tonight. Appreciate you, all of you that are watching online. We're glad. You need to claim, you need to say, I'm pressing into freedom and victory in my life tonight. I'm appropriating God's word unclean spirits go out of men and god wants to help us this evening amen and so we want to remind you of our morning prayer uh, 5 30 to 8 each morning our building is open monday through friday we'll be here wednesday night prayer at 6 30 service at 7 30 all the activities over the weekend remember the outreaches that are going on this week let god use your life praise god thank you jesus thank you jesus Feel God in this place tonight. Amen. He's setting some people free right now. And you're just like, it's like a light bulb went on and you realized this isn't me. I kept thinking it was me. I kept saying there's something wrong with me. That's the spirit. You have freedom. You have authority. The Christian is the ruling class of the spirit world. We have authority tonight. In Jesus' name, praise God. As our heads are bowed, I feel the grace of God in this place. Amen. George Villa, will you dismiss?